They know gun-free zones don't work. They know gun control doesn't work. They know all their assault weapons bans, magazine bans. They know they work, don't work. The evidence is, yes, unarguable. They know it doesn't work, but they still keep pushing it. And every single time there's a mass killing or any crime that they could take advantage of, they do. Whether the gun control they're pushing makes a difference or not, because they don't care. <laughs> And welcome back to the Firearms Nation podcast. And tonight, I'm going to be talking with author Larry Correa, who is a science fiction and fantasy writer. He is known for his Monster Hunter International stories, and he's a uh, couple times New York Times bestseller, which is very impressive. Uh, as we'll get into it, uh, probably not going to be for the book that we're talking about, but to have that on your resume is, is certainly uh, a big feat. Um, he is uh, award-winning in, in different uh, awards. He's written over 20 novels and published over 50 short stories. And the book that we're going to be talking about today is In Defense of the Second Amendment. Now, of course... A lot of people have different ideas about the Second Amendment, and we're on the Firearms Nation podcast, so of course we are pro Second Amendment, and uh, you know you can't have a First Amendment without the Second Amendment. So Larry's book uh, really breaks these things down, and once I picked it up, I couldn't put it down, and we'll get into it. Uh, but uh, just remember, this is also a live stream, and if you are posting comments and questions. During the interview, I'm not going to be able to address him. But afterwards, Larry said that he would be extremely generous with his time. And if you do have any questions for him, uh, feel free to ask and we will get to them. If you don't, well, it doesn't matter. But either way, uh, Larry, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, did I, did I mess up anything of your intro? Uh, did, I, did I hit all the salient points with, uh, oh, I know really? you've written a lot no, of books. Yeah. Yeah, I've read a ton. No, that's that's pretty. That was pretty close. I, I I'm happy with that. I'll take it. And <laughs> and do, do you make your uh, full time living as as an author now? Oh yeah, I've been a full time writer now for I want to say probably eight years. I think uh, before this, I was uh, the last real job I had. I was in military contracting, and uh, so I've been a writer uh, ever ever since. And uh, I love it. And it's actually I've got like one of the coolest jobs ever. I, I get to just you know make up stories and entertain people and have a good time. I got a wonderful fan base. I love them. And so, yeah, I, I'm a lucky guy. And you, you primarily write science fiction fantasy books. Is that correct? You know, I came across your book and it's a, it's a nonfiction book, obviously, but uh, I, you know, now that I read the book and I'm very interested in, in you, I will, my time is very limited, but I do enjoy good stories. Uh, obviously we've had Jack Carr on this, podcast before oh. and, and Jack is a friend of Firearms Nation and, and he's a great author. Uh, I like those kind of stories, but I'm also uh, a science fiction nerd at heart. I grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek, so uh, I'm interested to read some of your stuff. Cool. Yeah, I, Jack Carr, uh, for everything I've heard, of, I've never met him, but everything I've heard is this great guy. Um, I, I, I've, I've written thrillers too. I've got a thriller series with a guy named Mike Free. We did a thriller series, uh, but I'm mostly a fantasy novel uh, novelist. I've done science fiction, uh, done a whole bunch of different genres. I've done comedy. I've done comedy writing. I've got a series on Audible, Tom Stranger. Uh, it's comedy, uh, you know, interdimensional insurance agent, Tom Stranger. Uh, so I do a bunch of different weird stuff. And uh, this was actually my first nonfiction book. But my background before I was a writer was in the gun world. I, I worked in the gun business. I was a uh, I was a firearms instructor for many years. I owned a gun store. I was, uh, you know, for, for, for this audience, I was an SOT7, so machine gun suppressors, that kind of thing. Uh, I was a Utah concealed weapons instructor, uh, uh, basic pistol instructor, all that fun stuff. I uh, was involved in, like, local lobbying yeah, for gun rights at the state level. I did that for a lot of years, really enjoyed it. Uh, so I basically, this is a topic that I've been passionate about since I was a teenager, when I first you know, became a hardcore gun guy and started getting into this back at the dawn of the internet. And so about 30 years now, I've been into this stuff. And so when Regnery, the nonfiction publisher, was looking for someone who 
really knew guns, but was also a good writer who could tell kind of a narrative story about the Second Amendment and not just do like a cold statistical uh, analysis, factual kind of thing. They wanted someone who could actually kind of tell a story. And so they came to me and I, I would have, I would have did this for free. I mean, honestly, this is something I'm, I love. It's a subject I love. And so it gave me a chance to defend something that I really, truly believe in. So I, I'm, I'm thankful I got the opportunity to write this book. And you, did you grow up with guns? I think I read that you were in California and yep. it doesn't seem like it's a gun friendly type of place. I lived in California for 10 years yep. and never seemed like it was, it was gun friendly back then. And that was the nineties. So yep. we're kind of the same. I, well, I, uh, I come from the San Joaquin Valley of California. Uh, so where I was, was super gun friendly. Um, basically I, I come from the cows and plows part of California. So you could take my part of California and drop it in Idaho and no one would notice. Uh, we were very much armed to the teeth. Everybody where I lived had a gun. We, every pickup we were driving around with had shotguns in it. That's just how it was. Uh, I grew up around uh, hunting. We did a lot of bird hunting, pheasant hunting. And uh, I, I did a lot of pest control on the farm. I grew up on a dairy farm. And that's what I did for fun was shoot, shot a lot of twenty twos, that kind of thing. So yeah, I grew up around guns. Uh, my dad wasn't a gun nut, though. Uh, he actually thought that all the black rifle stuff was really weird. Um, I started getting into that when I was a kid, because I was back in the days where you'd see the magazine ads for the you know, HK-91s and uh, FALs and that kind of thing. And I thought that stuff was amazing. I wanted an Uzi so bad, right? My dad, you know, it's like Ruger Blackhawk was the epitome of uh, firearms technology, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I grew up around it, and then when I got older, actually, I... I I was able to like, uh, you know, do it for a living and I had a lot of fun with it. And, uh, I'm a gun guy. Can't help it. I love this stuff. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I discovered that myself too, actually, uh, living in LA, uh, before I got into law enforcement, I was in the, the Hollywood world. I was living in LA and writing screenplays and all my screenplays were somehow revolving around either, uh, cops, a lot of cops, but a lot of gun stuff. And so I would try and do as much research as I could and found that I really liked it. I liked going to the range. And then obviously, as, as I became a law enforcement officer and started really using it, I thought, you know, I need to get better. And that's how I got in competition and, and whatever, which I think is great. But, you know, you went into to writing, which is, is always fascinating. And I know this is not a writing specific uh, podcast. But uh, what, what were your influences as, as uh, someone who was trying to get into writing? Ironically, uh, so the first book I tried to write was in college, and it, it was not good. It was my Trading Wheels novel. Uh, it was a thriller, and then later on, I, I took all the good stuff out and put it into another novel called Dead Six, years later, once I knew how to write. Um, but actually, my first successful novel was a direct result of internet gun forums, believe it or not. Uh, I was on... Uh, back in those days was the firing line and the high road. Do you remember those days? Uh, sure. That yeah. and m4carving.net, ar15.com. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. And so what it was, was one of the guys was cracking jokes about uh, lines I'd like to hear in a horror movie someday. And it was basically if horror movies starred our people and how, how they'd be over really fast. And it was just people cracking funny jokes. And one guy made this joke or made a line that was so awesome that I wound up inspired to write a book <laughs> it was um you know what the difference between me and you really is you look out there and see a horde of evil brain-eating zombies i look out there and see a target rich environment and that line Very was nice. so dang funny that i was like dude i'm, I'm writing this and i i did i i was always a wannabe writer but that was the first thing i ever like really made it uh, uh a real go of it and actually that that turned into monster hunter international a few years later which was a huge mega hit. There's now millions of copies in print of that novel around the world. Wow. And uh, yeah, that one went, that one went nuts. Um, but it's all because the internet gun forums and I originally was self-published. And so the first place I, I owned a gun store at the time. Uh, and so I actually self-published my first novel and primarily sold it to online internet gun forum people. <laughs> that was how I started <laughs> out. And it, it my, and that's, that was the beginning of my career, and I've been doing this ever since. Just kind of went nuts. Okay, so how do you go from that to a New York Times bestseller? So what happened was there was a giant bookstore uh, called Uncle Hugo's in uh, in Minneapolis. It actually got burned during the riots, but they recently reopened. 
Um, yeah, it was, a, it was in a tough part of town. But Uncle Hugo's, a uh, huge, huge independent bookstore, uh, one of the employees was on one of the internet gun forums, read it, thought, and I thought it was amazing, told the owner. The owner wound up buying a ton of copies, um, selling them all, contacted the publisher at Bay and Books, where I've been ever since, told the publishers, like, you need to read this guy's stuff. This guy, this guy writes stuff that's so up your alley. She read it, loved it, made me an offer, and uh, I got my first publishing contract off of that. And then uh, 25 books later, I'm still at the same publishing house writing. Uh, that's where I write all my science fiction and fantasies for Bay and Books. Uh, so that they, they all because of um, telling wacky stories on an internet gun forum. For and, and I actually gunned up the first book. I, I made it more gun nutty than like the regular reading audience would be able to handle. I, I still to this day, you know, 13 years, 14 years later, people read that first book and they're like, wow, they, there's parts where there's so much gun stuff. I, I kind of skim. And I was like, yeah, that's because you weren't the original target audience that I was aiming this book at. <laughs> so yeah, it's, uh, it's been a hoot. Honestly, my, I have a, I have a weird career path, but it's, it's done. It's done really well. So I'm glad people like them. Do, do you find that people either hit or miss with you in terms of of, of how you're writing the stuff and, and incorporating all, because, you know, I, I find it in, in every cultural art, whether it's, it's film or uh, books or, or, you know, uh, not podcasts, but just music in general. Anytime. I mean, obviously there's the, you know, the hip hop rap, you know, gun culture, violence culture, but in terms of just like regular people reading stuff, you get that dichotomy where people are not really wanting to, to embrace it as much as, you know, they like to just fantasize about it. So do you, do you, it seemed like, you know, I was reading some of your social media and you get a bit of that, you know, canceling culture trying to, to attack you. Oh yeah. All the time. I'm actually kind of legend. Cause, um, I, I was, I was one of the proto battles, I guess, in the modern culture war of the whole cancel culture thing. Because when I came onto the writing scene, I actually got nominated for this prestigious award for uh, Best New Writer. And uh, what happened was immediately all these people came out of the woodwork freaking out because I owned a machine gun store. And I was a firearms instructor. And this is, a, you understand, this industry is 99.9% .9 out of Manhattan. Uh, and they don't, they, don't, they don't even understand half of America. Like they, they don't, they don't, if you're outside of Los Angeles and New York, they just don't even grasp regular red state America as being a, a thing. Uh, and so we're just a bunch of stereotypes to them. So I came on by the scene and they hated my guts immediately. So most half of writers, honestly, are just like regular Americans. I mean, everybody, they come from the same swath as uh, everybody else. And they're pretty politically diverse. However, for a while there, the people who had the wrong politics just had to keep their heads down. I didn't have that option right out the gate. So a couple of years in, I had just, I was, uh, you know, can't swear yet, but uh, I, w I was out of, you know, uh, a crap to give. <laughs> and so I just, I just ran with it. And I, I kind of started picking fights, uh, standing up for what I believe in. Uh, everywhere I've gone, ever since they've tried to cancel me. Uh, I had one this last week where I was a guest at a event, a event in Virginia and coming up next January. And I had a cancel bob come out to try to throw me out. The same old, same old. That's happened to me before. I got kicked out of a thing in Columbus. Uh, it is always, inevitably, it turns out that there's several hundred people that are happier there. And there's like a dozen cranks. Uh, but the, the dozen cranks are super loud on the internet. Kind of give this illusion. They're very powerful. But honestly, uh, I think we're past most of that. Because what happens is uh, too many people are wise to that scam now. For, for a few years there, the cancel mobs were very powerful. Uh, and could, they could throw a, a fit and get their way. But now, honestly, too many people have caught on to their to their tantrum. And so they've lost a lot of their power. Um, and now there's, there's a critical mass of people standing up and saying, Nah, you don't get the heckler's veto over every single thing in the universe. You can shove off. And it's actually been kind of awesome. Well, before I... I Continue with that. I just want to say something for uh, people who are watching the video version of this. Uh, Larry is using uh, Starlink to connect. 
uh, because of where he lives. And uh, we're, we're crossing our fingers that, that Biden doesn't shoot down the, the satellite, thinking that it's some sort of crazy Chinese balloon. Because uh, they kind of look alike in the sky. I, I've seen some pictures online of, of the Starlink making, you know, little streaks in the sky. You know, we, we might send a, a fighter up and, and shoot it down. Because we're shooting everything down at this point. But uh, so, yeah, so Larry's signal sometimes comes and goes. And it's, it's the Starlink uh, aspect of it, which is actually, if you think about it, pretty cool. You know, this is, this is uh, something that's going around uh, the world, you know, with all these different uh, satellites. We're able to get internet. Uh, so just keep that in mind. But getting back to what you were just talking about, do you think it's gotten worse now that you've published this book? Uh, yeah, they fired him up again because they hate guns. Uh, honestly, the, the, the universally, the cancel mob people all set, share the exact same philosophy. Uh, in fact, they won't tolerate anybody deviating it. Very religious. Um, and they hate guns. And so that was one of the things they actually brought up on this latest thing to get me thrown out is I had written a book about the Second Amendment and how horrible that is. How dare you? But you know what? No, uh, I, I do not back down from that at all. Because, I, like I say in the book, I mean, this is our sacred, God-given rights. I mean, it's a big deal. This is this is like one of the most important things about being an American is our ability and our right to defend ourselves. And so, no, I'm not going to back down because you're trying to throw me out of a science fiction convention. Oh hell no, that ain't going to happen. And so, uh, yeah, they they did it, it, they hate everything. And so that was just one thing for them to glom onto. But it's funny because some of them have tried to refute the book, and it's it it's so they're so dumb and they're so inexperienced that it's basically just I don't like that I I, I don't feel that's right. I've got sites and facts and and it's fact checked and lawyer checked and documented and I got you know thirteen pages of small print sites for everything I say in here. And they're like trying to refute it. And it's like the saddest thing ever because they're, they're so, they're so, they don't know what they don't know. So watching them try to argue something that I've been studying for, I'll, I'll put my 30 years of learning about the topic against their 30 minutes on Google, no problem, you know? And so it's actually been kind of funny to watch these people flail about because they just don't like guns and they have an emotional reaction to not liking guns and stuff. You bring another emotional response, but also you have facts and logic and the truth and history on your side, uh, it's pretty much irrefutable. And so all they can go with is their feelings. So yeah, they've tried and it's, it's been, it's been sad <laughs> to watch. So yeah, something that I, I want to do with this show is, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole book, but there's certain parts of the book that I, I want to discuss. And like for you to elaborate on because I think these are probably some of the the biggest arguments that people encounter, especially if you're uh, somebody who uh, carries a gun, believes in the Second Amendment, uh, enjoys shooting uh, in sports or in hunting or whatever you do, even just training with with guns. Um, but there's a, there's uh, some things you know that I just I don't get personally, and you know when I read this book. And I think this is such a great book and I highly recommend it to, to anybody who's listening to this or who's watching this uh, to go reach out and, and find this book. Uh, I, I will link it uh, down below uh, for sure. But it's a book, you know, there's, there's few books that I think that were written for me in mind. Uh, one of those books was, in, was with winning in mind by, by Lanny Basham, who is a, uh, a mental game guy. I don't know if you were ex ever exposed to some of his works, but he was a uh, an Olympic gold medalist. Originally, he was a silver medalist, and he he worked all these things on how to make himself up to be the gold medalist. But the the gist of it was the way it was written. It was like everything that I ever felt. So the same thing happened to me when I read this book. When you when you started talking about, and I'm sure a lot of people who are, are watching this has the same feeling. There's a mass shooting. And then you hear about it in the news or you get the text or you're seeing it, you're just thinking to yourself like, oh God, please don't be someone like me. Please don't have, you know, the wrong political uh, side. Don't have uh, uh, someone who is, you know, uh, uh, out there promoting the second amendment. You know, you just have all these, these gut visceral reactions to like, 
just not not this guy because you know what's coming next, regardless of it's coming next anyways. But you know what's coming next on TV. And if it's the wrong guy, it'll be gone in three days. But if it's the right guy for, for as you call them, the vultures, it's going to be going on for weeks upon weeks. And the politicians are going to latch onto it. And you're going to have to hear it at the water cooler, at the, at the drugstore, wherever you go. You can hear people talking about it. I've actually gotten to very loud arguments with someone in a doctor's waiting room because they were watching it on TV and they were saying such stupid stuff that I couldn't hold my tongue. So when, I, when, when you started writing that, I was like, oh my God. This is the book, and and that's why I had you have you on. Sorry, that's why I had to have you on so we could talk about it, so other people could get through that. So, all right. So, one of the things that that you bring up in the book, we'll get right into it. Is uh, we've had an influx of school shootings, and you know this has been going on. Actually, growing up, I I had a school shooting not that far from where I lived. Surprisingly, it was Highland Park, Illinois. Uh, there was a school shooting in, in Ravinia. But regardless, generally people think of school shootings starting with uh, Columbine. I mean, you can think, you know, the University of Texas would have been another one. But we have a lot of school shootings. And nobody really talks about arming the teachers. You bring this up. So why do you think it's a good idea to arm the teachers? All right, so my my state, uh, I, I, I used to teach in Utah. Uh, we have CCW in schools. So if you have a valid Utah concealed weapons permit, you can carry a gun in school. That's how our law is set up, fought battles here over that, and that's how it's been. And so right off the bat, we always hear the idea that, you know, arming teachers is impossible or it's all these horror stories are going to happen. Well, you know what? We've got a perfect good experiment here. We had this one state doing it for almost 20 years now, and we're fine. And right off the bat, I got to clarify, I, I don't mean mandatory. When I say arm teachers, I don't mean mandatory, not at all, because I get teachers freaking out saying, I, I, that's not my job. I don't want to carry a gun. That's fine. That's, that's up to you. That's good. That's your personal choice. However, if you make it voluntary, I guarantee that every single school has at least one or two or three people, not just teachers, but employees, janitor, bus driver, lunch lady, principal, I don't care, who are willing to step up and get trained and do what they need to do to be prepared to meet this kind of threat. Um, in the book, I talk a lot of examples. I taught a lot of people. Uh, cause I used to teach teachers for free. If you were a, a, an employee at any Utah school, I taught your CCW for free. And I used to have people come in all the time. I had one time I had a principal come in with a couple teachers and a guy who was a bus driver. And why do they all come in together? Because the week before they'd had an incident at school that turned violent, turned out a kid was armed. He didn't do anything and they got him talked down, but it was a bunch of disarmed teachers dealing with this because the school resource officer was a wall. He just wasn't there where he was supposed to be. So the principal handled this, but afterwards he realizes like, holy crap, I'm on my own. This is it. We're, we're our only line of defense. The line of defense the state gave us wasn't here. We could all got killed. So he gathered up the people around him who he knew were responsible, who would do this kind of thing. And they came in and they all took this class together. And that started them on their journey to get me all some more training. But for example, the, the, the bus driver was a or bus driver and I think janitor, but he was a young guy. He was in his 20s and he was a recently returned Iraq vet with multiple tours. And he had an MOS where he had quite a bit of training and quite a bit of experience. Well, he had more experience dealing with violence than any of the cops that would be responding. So why wouldn't you want this guy armed at your kid's school? You know, everywhere else, we have multiple lines of defense. We have d defense in depth. Uh, we don't have just, you know, one safety feature on a car. We've got airbags and seatbelts and anti-lock brakes. And if one system fails, hopefully the next system picks up the slack and makes a difference. With how come is it with schools and other gun-free zones? It's only one line of defense, and that's the government will send the cops. That's it. And what we've seen, and I go within the book a lot. I go, I bring the receipts on this. I go through the numbers. I go through a lot of examples. What stops a mass killer is a violent response. That violent response will either be immediate by someone who's there, or that violent response will take time for the cops to arrive. The longer that guy has to work, the more people get hurt period. So by arming teachers, we're installing speed bumps. You know, they might be able to shoot the guy and stop him, or they might just interrupt his plans 
They might force him to take cover. Really common. We see these events in with a self-inflicted gunshot wound because something burst the guy's fantasy bubble and he said, well, this isn't fun anymore, and he shoots himself. Anything that interrupts their plans with a any violent response is a, is a good thing because even if they even if they shoot the teacher in that moment, they're not shooting other kids. All right. So there, I mean, there are teachers who are willing to step up and do this. Let's just get out of their way and let's give them that opportunity. If they're going to volunteer to do this, then by all means, let's support that. And a lot more seats um, have this. And since Utah did it, there's a lot of other states have it. Some of them, they have a lot of weird hoops in the way, like Texas, for example. This is sad. Um, Texas is up to the local school board. So it's up to the school superintendent if they allow armed teachers or not. And then they have a program. But some school districts don't allow it, and other school districts do. Um, and, and and just, you know what? Get the administration out of the way. Let, let people who want to defend themselves defend themselves. Uh, Gun-free zones are just dumb. We know they're dumb. We know they don't work. We've got the numbers. Uh, We know that criminals target them specifically. We know criminals in their manifestos say, I'm going to attack this gun-free zone because I know no one there can shoot back, and I'm safe until the cops get there. The, The guy in Buffalo, the Buffalo shooter last year, specifically put that in his manifesto. So the, the thing is, is like, you know what, just get out of the way, let people defend themselves, put those speed bumps in, it's defense in depth. It's such a no-brainer, yeah, but but they, people are just dead set against it. And it's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a fight that I've been having for a long time, and so that's one of the first things I talk about in the book, was outlaying all the reasons we should allow people to be armed in places like that. You know what's what's interesting to me is that so take a country like Israel, and they had an incident, uh, uh, Milot, I believe it was called, where terrorists came on board a, a school bus and, and killed all the kids. And from that point on, you can't go on a, a field trip without, you know, it's like for every 10 students, there's one armed guy with an Uzi. And they've secured the schools. I don't know why in this country we are so against hardening our schools that they'll it'll screw up the psyche of the kids to see uh you know secure doors and and bulletproof windows and and armed guards that I think to me what 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 hurts kids more is probably uh seeing their friends bleeding out next to them. Well, it's such a weird thing too because I I, I have a theory on this um which is funny because right, schools already are, a lot of schools around America are basically prisons anyway, the way they set up. And so that, that's that's kind of a non-issue for them anyway. But in most of America, even if you don't have a hard and fortified building, if you have armed staff, no one's ever going to know. So it's, it's less obvious and it's less in the face of kids. It's less traumatic to kids because it's concealed. And so if it's, if the math teacher or the, it's usually the shock teacher, let's be honest, <laughs> in my experience, <laughs> was, I swear every time, you know, half the time I had a teacher, it was the shock guy. Um, all the ag teachers too, if you have ag, all the ag teachers are carrying, but, um, you know, these guys, they don't know. They, so the kids don't know it's, it's concealed under your person. It's in your shirt. They're, they're not cops. They're not openly carrying. They're not going to be displaying it. So it's less traumatic. Now my theory on why, uh, this is, is I, well, first, I got to specify one thing. When I talk about the vultures, I don't mean all people who are against gun law or all people who are against guns, all people who are in favor of gun control. I just mean the hardcore partisan, perched, waiting for bloodshed so they could swoop in and feast people. Because regular, most people who are anti-gun is because they've been lied to or they've been taught this and they just believe it. Um, you know, so when they have maybe an emotional reaction, and that's fine, you know, they're... Those are people I still hope to reach. But the vultures, on the other hand, they know. They know what they push doesn't work. They know gun-free zones don't work. They know gun control doesn't work. They know all their assault weapons bans, magazine bans. They know they don't work. The evidence is just unarguable. They know it doesn't work, but they still keep pushing it. And every single time there's a mass killing or any crime that they could take advantage of, they do whether the gun control they're pushing makes a difference or not, it's because they don't care. For them, they 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 don't care. They want a higher body count. And this sounds bad, but I, I 
I bring a lot of examples to the table in this book about these people showing that they prefer higher body counts. And when a good guy with a gun stops one of these events early, they get upset. They get offended. Um, if they want you to die so they can use you as a statistic to get more control. And it's gross and it's disgusting. And you know what? People need to call them on it. And uh, too many for too long, we just kind of like ceded the moral high ground to these people because they had the emotional argument. But you know what? An emotional argument is not wanting to be defenseless and helpless. And so we got we got the facts on our side. We got history on our side. We also have emotion on our side, and that's what we need to start bringing that. But like honestly, I, I used examples from the book. Um, remember last year there was the Eli Dickens shooting in Indiana. Uh, this kid was a hero. Bad guy comes in, starts shooting up a mall, immediately shoots a couple people in the first couple seconds. This tw early 20s kid is carrying legally, draws his Glock 43 yards away, opens fire, hits the bad guy multiple times, approaches and, and, and shoots him, finishes him off. Saves who knows how many lives. Hero, right? In any other day and age, this guy would be a hero. But immediately the vultures attack, and they were mad at Eli Dickin for stopping the bad guy. And I got, uh, I have links uh, before she deleted it uh, to where Shannon Watts from Mom's Demand Action was out there saying, well, who's the real bad guy? Because they were both carrying guns at them all. And she was trying to conflate this armed citizen who stopped the killer with the killer. I mean, that's the profound level of dishonesty and deceit that we are dealing with here with the vulture crowd. They don't care. They, they want you to die so they can dance in your blood. And it's, yeah, forget that. So what do you think the end game is? And I know I'm, I, I don't want to jump to the end of our discussion because we have a whole lot of stuff we got to get through. But what do you think? The, I mean, the end game, if you look at the big picture in this country, it would be impossible to get all the guns. And likewise, we're only talking about people who follow the law. We're only, I mean, that, that is the biggest fallacy of gun control is that we're only dealing with people who will follow the laws. We can have as million laws on the books, but the bad guys will not follow the laws. So they're still going to do bad guy stuff. It's the honest law-abiding citizens who are going to be the victims, who are going to be, uh, what was it? It was the EUs and the... Uh, the Morlocks, maybe you. Oh, get that, Eloy that. and the Morlocks. Yep. Eloy uh, and the Morlocks. Yes. Yep. The, the time machine. Yes. Yep. Time right. machine. In yep. the, yep. In the future, yep. the Morlocks were eating the EUs, and they were just like the happy-go-lucky people living in the sun and enjoying life until the Morlocks came up and took them. But that's basically what it is. It's people who are law-abiding, who just want to live their life, have their their ups and downs, make money, whatever they want to do. And then the bad, the evil comes because look, in my line of work, I've seen evil all the time. Evil will come and then they're defenseless against it. So I don't get what the end result is going to be because it would be impossible in this country to collect all the guns. So why is it always such a big topic of discussion? Or is it strictly just to generate money and votes? Okay, I think there's a few things. I go into this quite a bit. I think there's different motivations. On one hand, you have amongst the control freak side, they look at like the government of Xi Jinping in China as aspirational. Okay. They, I mean, they really do. They, they would love absolute control exercised by them, the expert class, to keep all us dumb peasants in our place. And you can't have that with an armed populace. That, that's, so that's part of it. Then there's some of these people who are just straight up grifters. It's big money uh, and they can get a lot of funding. From, from things like, you know, Michael Bloomberg, a uh, billionaire who has spent far more on the gun lobbying question than the NRA ever has. Uh, so you have people who it's business. Uh, then you have other people where it's honestly, I think this is almost a religious thing where there's certain cultural issues that are like considered right and left cultural divide issues. And gun control is seen as one of those things that is a right issue. And it really shouldn't be. And I talk about this in the book, too. It's for everybody. But they like to attack it because by attacking it, by extension, they're attacking the people they hate. Um, you like guns. We hate them. That's religious. And part of my religion is virtuously. I have to show 
all my friends how much I hate guns and how bad guns are. And I want to take them from you, you bad people, because you're sinners. So I think it, I think it depends. I, I, uh, their motivations depend. But I think the end game, honestly, if they could pull it off, would be confiscation uh, and a total ban. The problem with that is, like, like again, in the book, it's almost a logistical impossibility. And strategically, it would lead to uh, unspeakable chaos and bloodshed. Uh, so when we get people like Eric Swalwell, uh, Joe Biden, they're out there talking about this stuff. They, they, they're, Eric Swalwell is not a smart man. And so what he thinks that we can go, you know, they can just scoop up all the guns and take them away from Americans. He probably believed it because this is a sharp, sharp dude. Um, and I'm trying to like not say what I really think because <laughs> we'll get your channel demonetized on YouTube. And I don't really think that, but these guys get really flippant about this stuff. Um, and they have no idea what they're talking about. Other people who understand logistically how this stuff works realize what a nightmare scenario that is. They want to avoid it at all costs. So there, I always see this thing, and this is something I talk about in the book too, is um, nobody wants to take your guns. And we've all seen that, right? We're, we're arguing for gun rights and somebody will come along and say, nobody wants to take your guns, except they do. And we know they do. And we've seen them do it. Quit gaslighting us. Quit lying to us. Because they, everywhere they can take away the guns, they have. And um, the reality of the situation doesn't matter to them. Like I said, it's religious. Uh, where did we have mass shootings so far this year? California. Uh, we had repeated events in California. What did, they, what did the vultures immediately do? Call for nationwide and more gun control. And all this stuff, every single thing they fought for would be something that wouldn't have made a lick of difference in any of those cases. Plus, California has gun control already that's so strict that the vast majority of the rest of the states would not stand for it at all and would openly revolt. That doesn't stop them. They're still arguing for the same exact thing because they, they don't care. It's religious. So that that's a really long answer. <laughs> I, I But I, I honestly think that's what it comes down to. It's just religious control freakery. Yeah, the, the guy in the most recent one in, in California... He was shooting a, what was it? What are they calling it now? A uh, assault pistol. Yeah. I think, like, it was a, I think it was a Mac 10 or a Mac 11, but yeah, they're calling that an, an assault old, pistol. It was an old Cobra that was illegal in California for, I don't even know how long, uh, forever. And um, he's had it for, in his possession for like 30 years, if I remember hearing right. I, so what gun control law would have made a lick of difference on that. Now, what would have made a difference in an event like that is if some other people had been present and just shot him in the first couple seconds, which is the ideal outcome that does happen in other places in America, but is virtually impossible in California. No, oh, that poor guy was uh, fighting with him. You know, God bless him for doing that in that second club, but he, he was fighting with him. And uh, yeah, it probably uh, would have ended differently had it been armed. Um, okay, so... I, I don't want to take up so much of your time because we can just keep going down this rabbit hole. I want, I want to go into uh, some of these uh, in, in, in your chapter, you talk about all these things that get thrown out after uh, uh, a shooting. And I just want to hear what, so if people hear these, because this is what you're going to hear all the time. You're going to hear it in your social media. Uh, you're going to hear it where you're at church or uh, at work, these are the, the arguments that people are going to say after there's a mass shooting. So the, the first one, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the first one that I want to talk about is ban assault weapons, etc. So ban handguns, ban assault pistols, ban assault weapons. Uh, what is what is the retort to that? Why, why does banning the assault weapons not help the situation? Yeah, I go through and we've done it before and it did nothing. That's the first thing is we know it doesn't work because we've done it before. And it's we didn't do it failed. right. We didn't do it right. We didn't yeah. label every single one we wanted to get rid of. Which is really interesting because the criminals just never gave a crap. And they, even if it was a gun that was specifically on there, they're going to use it no matter what. And the other, um, so, so we know it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work in other countries too. But the other thing too, is I then asked people like, okay, define assault weapon. I was like, well, it's this and this really, they, they usually don't know what they're talking about, but what it comes down to is, they want to ban magazine-fed semi-automatic weapons. Okay. Well, here's the kicker. When they actually come out and say that, instead of assault weapon, that's most of the guns in the U.S., and that's pretty much everything that we use for self-defense. When they say they want to ban assault weapons, really what they want to do is they want to ban armed self-defense. 
That's what it comes down to. And then I've seen some of these states, uh, people are, well, we don't want to ban everything. Yeah, you do. Because we've seen some states where they keep rolling off the And what do they do? They keep adding more and more guns to, under the banner of assault weapon. Or they say, well, you shouldn't have a weapon of war. Weapon of war is one of those goofy misnomers because everything has been a weapon of war. I mean, the pump action shotgun is a weapon of war. The bolt action rifle is a, is, the bolt action rifle was a weapon of war before it was a hunting gun. Even the, the lowly revolver was a weapon of war. Up in, in my lifetime, it was issued to air crews. I mean, so it's not, everything is a weapon of war. So that's a stupid term. And plus, if you look at the actual meaning of the Second Amendment, as reaffirmed by the Supreme Court, we're supposed to have weapons of war. Uh, that's the part they don't want to talk about. And I, I mean, I go there. I talk about the meaning of the Second Amendment. It's for us to have weapons equivalent to our, uh, you know, political overclass so that we are not just unarmed serfs. Uh, the Second Amendment is so we can defend ourselves against criminals up to and including a tyrannical government. And so very specifically, we are supposed to have weapons of war. Um, so honestly, it's a semantic game where they start playing with like people's emotions and ignorance. Um, and it's funny because I don't know how many people over the years where I've had who are kind of on the fence and they're like, well, let's ban assault weapons. And I'm like, then I take them shooting and I show them, you know, my assault weapons. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I, that's, I, that's not what I thought it was. It never is. They're usually thinking about machine guns, but they don't understand the NFA. They don't understand that that's been super highly regulated for 90 years, um, but we still have illegal machine guns. So even though we've had an almost total ban on ma new machine guns in the United States uh, for longer than most of us have been alive, and no new ones since we were little kids, and uh, there's still machine guns and crimes all the time. I mean, how many gangbangers do we see out there in videos posting their Glocks with their 3D printed switches, you know? Bad guys are going to make machine guns. This stuff isn't complicated. And if they're going to go catch a felony charge and commit a bunch of crimes, they don't give a crap about having one more felony charge because their gun is illegal under some law they've never even cared about. So, yeah, the assault weapon thing is complete nonsense. Utter and complete well, I, nonsense. I, I think they're, they're, they're more concerned about the, the fully semi-automatic guns those are the really bad ones the fully semi-automatic yeah. ones with the shoulder things that go up yeah the shoulder you, you got to get rid of those those uh pistol braces because I, I so many people have been shot in these mass killings with pistol braces i think pistol brace by True. itself could can hurt you so yes i actually so i, I delve into that because this the, the ATF pistol brace ruling came down after the book was done, which is why I have a little note at the beginning about to make sure you check the current laws, uh, where I, I, I was very flattering to the ATF. <laughs> but so when you actually look at the numbers in that 293 page ruling, this is the part that blows my mind. The ATF is basically making millions of us felons overnight if we don't comply. We're looking at 10 to 40 million people. I mean, it's an astronomical number of people. Actual numbers probably somewhere in there, but it's at least, you know, by 10 million people. And that's coming up like, ATF, what, 20 days? 20 days? Oh, no, it's 120 days 120 starting days. January 31st. So we've got like 107 more or something. Um, and it's, it's, it's lawsuits everywhere about it. But deep in that 293 pages, the ATF says how many crimes or, I'm sorry, investigations and traces the ATF has done involving brace guns out of the millions and millions of circulation. And this is going back to 2017, or sorry, 2015, 151. 151 cases, so not murders, 151 traces going back for the last seven years, and that justifies making 10 million of us felons overnight. I mean, think about how insane that is, how crazy that is, and that's our justification. The whole brace thing doesn't make a lick of sense. The NFA, I, I go into the NFA quite a bit because a lot of our modern gun law issues are based on the NFA, this old, archaic 1930s law that didn't make a lick of sense in the 1930s, and technology has made it completely backwards. Um, yeah, the brace thing, though, is honestly, I think the biggest uh, issue we're facing right now at the federal level, and then at the state level, you've got all the freakouts with all, like, we basically have seven holdout states fighting really hard against the Bruin Supreme Court decision. Um, so that's the new stuff that's come out since the book was finished. 
it takes a while to get stuff published. Um, and I mean, look, I mean, what what is that AR going to do against an F fifteen? I mean, oh, you know, you can't fight gosh. an F fifteen with an AR. I mean, don't you feel it's it's so patronizing and condescending when people say, "Oh, we're just going to nuke you"? I mean, the the obviously are. I think they're just trying to get our goat when they say stuff like that, because I mean, it, like you mentioned in the book, you could look in Afghanistan, who who basically not only took on the Russians, they took on us and two of the world's biggest superpowers at their time, and they're still around. And then what's going on yeah. in Ukraine? Uh, it's 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 not as easy as people think to you know. Is, but look where there've been no guns when you look at Nazi Germany when you look at uh, Cambodia, when you look at some of those other places where they didn't have guns. Uh, so that's why I think, you know, America is a very unique and wonderful country is that we, we do have the, the First Amendment so that you're free to have religion and free to have speech and all these other things, but we also have the Second Amendment to back it up. Uh, but I digress. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, no, you don't need to... You're, 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 you're absolutely spot on on that. But you don't need an AR for hunting. Why, why would you need an AR for hunting? What could you possibly do? Why do you want to kill? You want to shoot it 50,000 times? Full auto? Fully semi-auto? The, the deer don't wear Kevlar, man. No, uh, <laughs> That's right. He said dude, that. You're right. He did. Joe Biden. Okay. So first off, the whole thing about the Second Amendment being for hunting is nonsense. We all know that. And that's just a giant lie posted off on the people. Like I say in the book, the founding fathers didn't fight a war against the most powerful army on earth to then immediately codify their right to hunt deer. I mean, let's, let's, that's just asinine. And Joe Biden, that he, he, he was talking about that at a Martin Luther King Day speech, which is extra galling, because Martin Luther King was a guy who fought for peaceful resolutions, who then had his Second Amendment rights denied by the government. Uh, he wanted to get a concealed weapons permit, and they wouldn't let him, because he upset them. And so you think about this, and then Joe Biden goes up there and just gets all flippant about how he could kill us with fighter jets. You know, I, I actually have a big chapter in the book about this specifically, and I have to put my, um, I used to be a military contract accountant, so I was a number cruncher, uh, is what I did. And so I had to put my logistics hat on and talk about, like, really what it comes down to, this whole thing about, we're going to go out, we're going to just kill all the gun owners with our advanced weapon systems. No, you're not. That's not how any of this works. That's, that's, that's a, that's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It's not how that works. I think how it's going to go down. I go into like how these weapon systems work, who runs them, who maintains them, who flies them. Uh, and like I said in the book, the only thing separating those advanced weapon systems from the people they expect to ball with them is a chain link fence. And the guys that maintain those weapon systems are guys like us. I mean, we're just, if you look at the Venn diagram of the, of the, of the people who do this, it's not a unified circle over here where it's like people who, hate the Second Amendment are willing to bomb their neighbors and, and the rest of us. No, we're the ones that actually fix this stuff. So there's no front line. The Taliban didn't have a, or, or the Taliban didn't have fighter jets. And if you think the, ta I mean, if you think the Taliban was banned, imagine trying to fight Florida man. I mean, good luck. And I mean, yeah, it could happen. So, so the whole thing, I mean, I go into this in a lot of depth, but for example, at any given time in Afghanistan, I'm sorry, any time, given time in Iraq, we're fighting about 20,000 insurgents, give or take. I mean, if only a teeny fraction of a percent of American gun owners were to get uppity over confiscation, I'm talking a tiny fraction and fraction of a percent, you're still looking at a number that is orders of magnitude larger than the number of F insurgents we've fought at any time with the most powerful military coalition ever where we had secure operating bases and we had, you know, plenty of logistical support. This ain't going to happen. And like the whole thing on nukes, okay, so you're going to use nuclear weapons on what, Omaha, Nebraska? Uh, uh, you know, there's an Indiana. You're going to blow up towns, Eric Swalwell. And so it's completely asinine. And I honestly, my, my most fervent wish is that the people in charge would not be so flippant about what they're talking about here. Um, they're, they're so ignorant and bloodthirsty uh, and self-aggrandizing know-it-alls that they're talking about pushing the big red button and they just don't get it. They don't even sort of understand what they're talking about unleashing on America. It would be 
the worst thing ever, not just for us, but for the entire world. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare scenario, and that is why we have the Second Amendment. Because if a nation as powerful as us ever became truly evil and tyrannical like that, then, you know, God help the entire earth. So, yeah, no, I... I that Joe Biden drives me nuts for a lot of reasons, but that's probably towards the top of my list. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell with some of them. I think they're they're just being grandiose and trying to gin up stuff for their for their base and stuff because yeah i mean it if you actually had a discussion and drew out their arguments everyone on the other side is going to say yeah we're not nuking our own people in this country um let's just get back to some of these things what about uh you know just why don't we just ban magazines over a certain amount 10 rounds or no in like new york seven rounds uh I remember it was after Sandy Hook, they, they passed their uh, safety act. And uh, the next day, every law enforcement officer was in violation of the law, the state law, because they had, quote unquote, high capacity magazines, which is basically full capacity magazines for their clocks. But because it was more than seven rounds, they were, and then they had to go back and amend it. But yeah, wh why not we just, you know, make two round magazines? Would that be better? And our Joe Biden says you could double barrel shotgun and fire both rounds into the air um, through the door. He said too. That was through great. the door, no. right? Which is yeah. illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a as a instructor, I was like, oh no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> but um, honestly, the the mag band thing is I I spend a, I spend a a little bit of time on the mag band thing because that's one of those seems like a, a a do something that they really glom onto for emotional reasons. A it doesn't work. Um, B it's irrelevant. And so back during the assault weapons ban, when they banned magazines over 10 rounds uh, federally, we had criminals all the time doing crimes with magazines that were higher capacity because they're basically just sheet metal boxes or now plastic boxes. So it's even easier. Um, they don't really ever go away and you can make more. And even then we would bust uh, criminals. I'm sure you saw this where they'd have a mag that says, you know, for military or law enforcement use only because they don't care. They just don't care. And now we're to the point where 3D printing, I can make Glock magazines all day for about a buck fifty a pop. You know, I can squirt out Glock magazine bodies. Um, so it's it's not gonna work. And plus, even if you could magically make a you know, get a GD and vanish all of the magazines in the world, bad guys get to pick the engagement range. Uh bad guys can just bring more than one gun. Uh like of these mass killers are worried about. They're not stupid. Some of them are, some of them are, but some of them are crazy, but most were just evil. They're actually pretty smart. They're just evil. They're not going to like walk up to you and shoot you and then let you wrestle the gun away unless you're really stupid. They're probably going to shoot a bunch of people and then they're going to reload and then move to the next position. And even if you're a fumble fingered idiot, you can do a reload pretty quick. Uh, so we know it doesn't work. They don't care. It's irrelevant. And it disarms law abiding citizens. Uh, and I get into that too. So we get back to the true meaning of the Second Amendment. By golly, we want big mags. Specifically, we want normal capacity mags. But then just for normal self-defense against regular criminals, if you're saying that self-defense against regular criminals is okay and morally justified and legal, then you need to let people have ammunition. And you might need more than seven rounds. Because, I mean, and you know this, and you've done, you've done firearm training. People miss under stress. Or bad guys will get hit multiple times and not stop. And so saying that there's some arbitrary magic number of you get 10 rounds, that's, that's plenty. What if it's not? And then that guy dies. That innocent citizen dies because that 10 rounds was insufficient. Uh, and you think that'd be on that politician's head, but they don't care. And it's totally irrelevant to them. Uh, I've seen all sorts of arbitrary numbers tossed out there, and it's just all silly. And the, the, the magazine ban falls down on so many logical reasons. It's it's just nuts, but they keep coming back to it. They love that one. That's one they're very fond of. Also, Supreme Court smacked that down. Uh, where they got into the thing about common and useful um, with, uh, with Heller and Bruin. If it's useful for militia purposes, then we should be able to have it. Uh, and if it's common, we should be able to have it. And also, there needs to be a historical precedence. And there's never been a historical precedence of of, of limiting this. And like Joe Wine likes to say, well, you can't own a cannon. And yeah, Joe, you can. It's perfectly legal to own a cannon. You just need to do a certain few certain things. You can own a cannon. 
and the founding fathers own cannons. They own a bunch of cannons. All the Civil War, all original Revolutionary War cannons were privately owned. And some of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had cannons and private warships with a bunch of cannons on them. And so there is no historical precedent to ban uh, the amount of ammunition you can fire. That's just, that's foolish. And it's, it's always proposed by people who are protected with people who have guns. And it's, Absolutely. it's the people who aren't super rich, who again, just want to live their life and not have the evil come and, and do horrible evil things that evil tends to do. Uh, I just, a couple more, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. You know, the, the biggest, there's two big ones that always get thrown around in the media. Uh, just like, can't we just have universal background checks? And oh. that would solve all our problems. So, I mean, I mean, that sounds great, right? You have universal background checks. I mean, why isn't that working? Yeah. I go into that one. I have a section on, on background checks. And the thing is, people realize we already have them. Uh, where you can buy a gun, the whole 4473 uh, National Instant Check System process, which doesn't work. So we already have one who jumps through, which we know doesn't work, and the government doesn't even care uh, that it doesn't work. But we still have to do it because it's just more hoops for us to jump through. So it doesn't work anyway. But B, let's say they did have one. They say universal background checks. They mean things like stopping private sales uh, from individuals. So basically, if I, I wanted to sell a gun to you or you to me, we'd have to go through a third party to conduct a background check and fill out those paperwork. Okay. Criminals don't give a crap. Every single person that can't pass a background check has a gun if they want one anyway. Every single crook on the street. Why? Where do criminal guns come from? Statistically, overwhelmingly, they are purchased from somebody who stole them from a car or a burglary. Overwhelming, or they stole it themselves. That is the vast, overwhelming majority of crime guns in America, as they don't care. So the background check system is simply irrelevant because they're just going to steal them from somebody who did pass a background check. Uh, and then we see, even when people fail the background check, the government doesn't prosecute them anyway. Uh, in the book, I talk about straw purchases. Cause back when I used to sell guns and own a gun store, uh, we'd see straw purchasers. And a straw purchase is basically where you'd have somebody come in. Uh, who couldn't pass a background check and they would have a friend or their girlfriend usually would come in and buy the gun for them. But unless you know that's happening and they're really stupid and obvious about it, you're not going to know. I mean, if they're stupid and obvious about it, we don't make the sale. Because honestly, the vast majority of the time when it was stupid and obvious, it was ATF agents or CIs testing us to, to, to see if they could bust a gun dealer. Um, but if they're clever... And they just, and the guy gives the girl a post-it note and says, go buy me one of these. Then there's no way the gun store can know. And she's going to come in and she passes a background check and then she's going to take it out and give it to her gangbanger boyfriend. But realistically, the gangbanger boyfriend's not even going to bother because he's just going to buy it off somebody on the street who stole it. Um, I got to tour a, a Utah State Crime Lab one time and I got to see the, the big room of crime guns. This is uh, all the murder guns and... Uh, gun season shootings going back for like the last 30, 40 years. And you know what most of the guns in there were? Uh, cheap, cheap crap and hunting guns that had the saw, the stocks and barrels hacksawed off them. Like overwhelmingly. Because they would just steal somebody's shotgun and hack, they'd steal grandpa's duck gun and hacksaw that sucker off and call it good. As cr crooks don't care. Um, yeah, so, no, background checks, they don't work. They're, they're pointless. It's just a hoop to jump through for a bunch of people. Also, I go into the one thing people don't realize is I go into the logistics of like, if you were to actually have a functioning universal background check system, what you would have to require for paperwork for regular people. As people don't realize, uh, dealers, FFLs, if like I'm selling goods, I have to have a bound book where I keep meticulous records of every serialized item I have. And then I have to show when it came in and when it came out in what 4473 it's attached to when it went out. And the ATF audits set to make sure everything matches. If you had to put that on every single person in America, it would be a logistical paperwork impossibility. People can't do that. You can't expect grandma uh, to sell a shotgun that she's had in the closet for 20 years to keep a meticulous... Uh, bound book of serial numbers. 
So it's it's legally it makes no sense. So yeah, no universal background checks, utterly pointless. And this goes right into uh, the last one. It kind of touches on this: is that uh, we got to close the gun show loophole because you yeah. just walk into that bazaar with you know your your wad of cash and you're like, I want that gap right there, and they just give it to you because that's that happens every day in this country. Oh my gosh, that one blows me away because this is what we've been arguing about for thirty years, <laughs> and. Uh, I used to I used to work at the gun shows, and I hate to break it to the people out there. If you're an FFL, and I, I had to explain this in the book, if you're an FFL, if you're a licensed gun dealer, every single gun you sell is on that bound book and needs to correspond to a 4473 coming off. Uh, and so every single thing we do, we're calling in or we're on the computer all day long at that gun show, calling in background checks. What they're talking about the gun show loophole. It doesn't necessarily mean gun show. It's just anywhere because any private person who's not an FFL can sell their own property to somebody else. Now, if you're engaging in business and selling a bunch of guns, the ATF will come in and bust you for it because you're engaging in business. You should be an FFL. But anybody should be able to sell a gun. What that usually is is some dude bought something and his wife got mad at him because it cost too much. So he sold it to a coworker. Or somebody needs to pay rent and they're they're broke this month, so they sell one of their guns to a friend. Or, you know, something like that. That is most private gun sales. Or the other one is stuff like um, at state, uh, like if it's a big estate, usually it gets sent to an FFL and the FFL sells all the guns it wants. But like, let's say grandpa dies and he's got three or four guns in the closet, uh, grandma's going to sell them. And that should be perfectly legal. But... So the way I start with gun show loophole, it doesn't matter if it's in the gun show or in your house or your office break room or the parking lot of Denny's. <laughs> you know, I mean, the last time I bought a gun off a random guy was in, was in the parking lot <laughs> of, of, of a place. It, it doesn't matter. But uh, so the gun show loophole is one of those scary sounding things that people just don't even understand what they're talking about. And it goes back to the universal background check system. And unless you have that, then there is no control over it anyway, and you'd have to require everybody in America to keep a serialized bound book. Ain't going to happen. There's just no way. And again, I keep stressing this. This is only going to be for law-abiding citizens. And you said it too. The criminals, they're going to do what they want, and it's only affecting us, not them. Uh, I think that's what the focus should be. So before we get into uh, some questions that are here, I just want to say, what do people do? All right, so now... They obviously they're going to go out, they're going to buy this book because it goes through all these arguments. It gives you some concise answers that you can help educate people, uh, not just, you know, just say, I want my guns, but why? Why is it necessary that, that we have an armed populace that you want to self, have self defense and, and be rational about it? So that's the book. But what, what can people do otherwise to help promote the, you know, the country and the second amendment and, and, you know, continuing having it. Yeah. That's actually what I close. That's actually the last thing I write about in the book is what I close on is, is what we can do for the future. Cause I really believe we're winning. Um, we are winning in the culture war. Uh, we have made huge strides. A lot of people get very black pill doom, but in the, in my lifetime, it's changed a lot for the better. We're we've met, we've lost some things, but we've gained so many others and we're pushing back. Now what we can do, there's multiple levels. It depends on who you are and what you know. Um, a lot of people, you know, they want to go out and they want to fight and they want to, they want to, you know, help lobby and legislate and get involved and be involved in pro gun organizations. Uh, you know, be an evangelical gun owner. That's awesome. Do that. But for a lot of people, honestly, the most powerful single thing you, you can do in this culture war is take new people to the wrench. Um, Honestly, I said just as valuable as some lobbyist out there is a grandpa taking his granddaughter to the field to shoot cans off the fence with a 22 for the first time ever. Uh, honestly, that is the most powerful thing you can do is you go out there and you get people who are maybe on the fence or they're uneducated. Take them to the ranch. Show them this stuff. Teach them. Show them that this stuff is not what they think it is. It's not scary. This is normal. It's a normal part of life. And you break that ice and you get through to people. That's the key to winning the debate. That's the key to winning the culture war. And we are. We've been doing that. We've been making huge gains. Uh, the demographics of gun ownership changed dramatically. 
uh, especially after 2020, when a lot of people who are out there who thought, hey, you know, I'm just going to call the cops and the cops will take care of it, right? 2020 came along and that proved that that was not the case. And a lot of people had to wake up that, hey, I called 911 and they said, good luck, you're on your own. And a lot of America was like, oh boy. And so gun sales went through the roof. People were buying whatever they could get, standing in line, paying scalpers prices. And that wasn't us. That wasn't me and you because we don't pay over MSRP, right? We got ours. We're not, we're not freaking out. This is regular people. And so now those people are out there and they've got a gun. You know, it's our job. Let's 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 help them. Let's let's bring them along. Let's let's get them educated. Let's get them trained. Let's say, hey man, come to the range. I'll show you how to use that. Um, you know, I, and, and I want to point you towards good people and good instructors, good sources of information. That's what we can do. That's the key. Awesome. So let's just uh if you have any other questions, people who are watching, go ahead and put them in. I'm gonna go through and look back through the chat and see uh, if there were any questions here. And then we'll let uh, Larry go and do some more writing for the day because he's got to get his thousand words in or whatever his <laughs> method is. Uh, so Don Quixote wants to know when will the next, I guess, Monster, Monster Hunter International book come out? Uh, October. Does it have Some a title? Ball, I'm, uh, it says <laughs> Monster Hunter Memoirs Fever. Uh, it's by me and Jason Cordova. That will be out in October. And then the next regular main series, Monster Hunter, will be out in 2024, but I don't have a date for that yet. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? Don't... See. Yeah, everything is dark and scary. Yes. Um, the, that's, that's the assault weapons ban. It was... It's the scary stuff, you know, pistol braces, the silencers, you know, I, I didn't want to go too far off, but how many of these active killer stuff are being done by weapons that are suppressed? Oh my gosh, I'm not even aware of any. I don't think so. Um, I, 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 I can't I, think, I can't think of one. No, I, 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 I study the stuff, I talk about the stuff, and uh, I've never heard of one. If someone's heard of one, please send me an email, let me know. But yeah, I have not. Um, apparently, the Afghanistan kicked out the British too back when Britannia ruled the waves. Okay, that's from Melvin. Thank you, Melvin. I did not know that. Um, and then, what else do we have here? Oh, here's an interesting question. This is from Orval Garage. What are your thoughts on the P80 Ghost in quotes guns? Yeah, that's actually interesting. I talk about that a little bit um, in the book. We've been allowed in this country as part of our rights to build our own firearms since the founding of, or just before the founding of our nation. Um, people building their own guns should be perfectly fine and reasonable. And the government coming in and trying to control, uh, you know, eighty percent lowers is asinine. And it's also pointless, too, because anybody who wants to make an illegal, untraceable gun could just do it. Uh, that's I'm so easy. Uh, cheap home uh, machine tools, bench presses, or I'm sorry, but, uh, drill presses, and now uh, 3D printing. Gun control is effectively dead as far as the effectiveness of it. I mean, it's still a pain in the butt for us. They can make us all felons. But as far as actually stopping the creation of guns, impossible. And I even use examples from around the world, uh, like right now in Burma, uh, where, there, where there are rebels fighting with 3D printed 9mm subguns. I mean, you could see them on the news using 3D printed subguns. And so, yeah, no, 80% lowers. And that, that, we're not done with that in court yet either. We're going to see more in that in court, I think, uh, relatively soon there's still some there's still some lawsuits out there pending about that so it's going to be really curious to see what happens with the with the lowers well we've been going more than an hour and uh like i said i don't want to take oh wow <laughs> up. yes i know we we can go on and on and on it's a great conversation I'm, i so thank you for for coming on and i just want to say to people watching people listening go ahead uh if, if you're on YouTube, you know, share the video, uh, like the video so that YouTube sees this content as something that's important, not something that they should get rid of. Because uh, right now I hear there's a lot of stuff on YouTube with gun channels that are, are kind of scary. Again, 
Uh, it kind of goes in cycles. Uh, but uh, if you like this kind of content, be sure to subscribe to the channel and uh, or subscribe to the podcast so we can bring on people like Larry. And please go out and buy his book. It's a, a really good book, gives you a uh, perspective and gives you good arguments to counter the, the anti-gun crowd that's out there who are, in my opinion, a lot of it's just misinformed. I think his, he shares that same opinion. Uh, but again, Larry, thank you so much for uh, coming on and, and sharing your knowledge with the Firearms Nation. Thanks, I appreciate it.